for Groff, and for the last year I have been working to serve the anti-trafficking community and survivors of sex trafficking. So this woman, I met her recently teaching a workshop. Her name is Vanjie, and on the surface, um, back in the day, many people would have labeled her as a prostitute. But the truth is, is that she's a survivor of sex trafficking, and her story is much like most of women who are impacted by this social injustice. Um, the difference with her story that um, contradicts what you may have seen in movies and on uh, mainstream media is that she wasn't forced, she wasn't kidnapped, and she was never changed to a bed. But she was emotionally manipulated and emotionally abused by someone she loved and cared for. To the point that she was forced to sell her body on this street corner to meet her trafficker's quota. If she did not meet her trafficker's quota, she would face extreme abuse, threats to her family, including her own child. So I was very much inspired by her story um, because she was never rescued. Um, in fact, it was her desire to live, her perseverance and resilience that rescued herself from this horrible situation and got herself on the road to recovery. So this is her story from the workshop. So when it comes to sex trafficking, we have a lot of issues. Um, these are just a few. Um, the overlap of the commercial sex trade and sex trafficking creates a policing conundrum. Um, oftentimes, police aren't able to identify a victim of traf trafficking versus a person that's willingly um, engaging in sex work. You also have legislation that victimizes survivors and an overwhelming need for services to help with rehabilitation, stable shelter, and um, living wages. So the big question that I faced is what can social journalism do to impact sex trafficking? Um, it took a lot of listening from my community to figure that out because I was inundated with a lot of information and a lot of problems. Um, but through listening, I was able to come up with that we need to stop being the voice for the voiceless and amplify survivors' voices and engaging them to tell their own stories. The next was to elevate empathy and reduce stigma around prostitution because often these women are facing a lot of um, unwelcome behavior from people that sh could potentially help them. Then, deepening awareness beyond the stereotypical narratives, and this can best be done on where people get their news and information through social platforms and using multimedia. And then last, because um, social journalism is a service, we, I want to report the stories that meet unmet needs. So how did I engage my community? Well, I decided to create a workshop, and this is a page from my workbook. Um, so I taught a creative writing workshop that introduced survivors to tool that, tools that can empower them to tell their own story. And then I would crowdsource, those, crowdsource survivor stories and share them on social media. Then I realized after the first workshop that I kind of leave the room and now the connection to my community no longer existed. There was no way to talk to them again and I live here in New York and they're in Ohio. So I created a Google voice number that was local and accessible to them using a landline to serve as a listening post to keep the communication open. And then um, for engagement, uh, I create, developed a website called righttobeheard.us. Um, I invite you to visit it. Uh, however, um, I this, this created the workshop early on in the semester, and that was really before understanding that my community has an access to technology barrier. Um, but I'll come back to that later. Then, I created a tool to go on the website that would help a person that was a victim of trafficking understand how could this happen to them. So um, there's a research study that shows that adverse childhood experiences, if you have four out of ten, you're very likely to face significant impact later in life. And then last, um, the next story, this is where survivors can reach out to me and let me know their reporting needs, and I would try to report the story along with them. So, and I just want to mention that there are three stages to surviving trafficking. Um, you have a victim who's potentially still in the life. You have survivors who are on their way to recovery, and you have thrivers, and they have long, so they're living more stable lives at this point. So my different ways of engaging them varied by which stage they're on, <clears throat> we're at. So um, where I kind of got inspired from my practicum was um, in Kensington, Philadelphia, where I went to a drop-in center 
as you can see here, this is where the drop-in center was located on this street. It was actually the entrance underneath an XXX video shop, so the irony could not be lost. And then I learned that they um, practice an art for self-expression. So every week the women are invited voluntarily to join a group where they explore painting and different ways of expressing themselves through art for therapy. And the entire walls of the drop-in center were covered with their work and you could tell they were really proud of it. And this was my inspiration for cre the creative writing workshop. So I got on a plane and I flew to Columbus, Ohio, never been there before, and then also to Bangor, Maine, which is about three hours north from when I used to live in Portland, so that was a new experience too. I taught two workshops, six were offered, 13 attendees, and 11 stories compiled. This is one of the um, venues for the Bangor, Maine workshop. So my premise, my foundation for the workshop was to have the participants start to explore telling their story through a uh, t challenge that Ernest Hemingway did where he was asked to tell a story in six words. Um, and it was actually um, pretty powerful to see what the women came up with. These are their stories. You can see more at Right to Be Heard on Instagram. <laughs> um, sorry. So to amplify their voices, um, I chose the platform Instagram because I just thought it was a powerful way to add impact. It's a short story with an image. So that was my preferred medium. And then, like I said, to engage my community and keep the conversation going, I started this listening post um, that overcame the access to technology. Um, workshop participants can tell more stories. And then the next phase is using ITTT to take the trans transcribed stories on uh, Google Voicemail and then tweeting them out to the Right to Be Heard Twitter channel so that they have remote but some access to social media. This is the website that, website that I created in the first semester. Um, yeah. And um, now that I've learned a little bit more about um, the population, that the community that I've been working with, I realized that this would be good for survivors that have long been thriving. So I would invite them to come here and share resources for other survivors or to join a community with other thrivers and then to keep the conversation going about sex trafficking by letting me know what stories they would like me to report on. And then the other tool on that website, which I mentioned earlier, was something we did in design that used coding to make a calculator at, out of the adverse childhood experience um, research study. So people would ask 10 questions about their childhood. If they answered four or more, it would direct them to how this may have negatively impacted them and made them vulnerable to being trafficked. So um, I tried to engage the anti-trafficking community, more of the people um, working in service providing um, and I posted stories on Medium, some Twitter and Facebook activity, uh, so there's that. <laughs> and uh, to <laughs> um, continue again to report on the unmet needs of the community, I focused on policing prostitution and I requested uh, 10 years of data from the Department of Justice Services, Criminal Services, just, yeah, DCJS. And um, I analyzed that data at a different couple points, and I learned that 77% of women arraigned for um, prostitution in Queens are Asian, and I started to research and try to figure out why. And I learned that traffickers leverage immigration status. Victims don't often disclose to police because of Stockholm Syndrome and cultural barriers. And then we ultimately would hope for a paradigm shift where we don't arrest women in the sex trade, but that we go after buyers. So at the end of this journey, I was really excited to get the community feedback that survivors are still talking about the workshop to this day. And when somebody apparently says six words that are relevant to their stories, someone announced that's a six word story and began teaching them how they could write a six word story. And then the survivors themselves, um, after eight years of going to the well, she um, had never enjoyed a workshop so much. It's been her favorite, so that was really encouraging. And then Deidre asked if I can come back, which I would love to do. So thank you, and this is how you can reach me. <laughs>